Well, I'm Rocco. You guys know me at this point. I work here mainly. I work at Living Web, but I'm, most of the time I'm here uh, on this piece of property. And uh, let's just jump into it and then we'll go for a walk. Let me give you a real basic idea of fertility. I just want to break this thing down a little bit, just take a second and look at it a little closer and see some of the components that we're working with here. This is an aspect of fertility. It's not all of it. I'm not tackling that. So as you all probably know, not to take you back to eighth grade, but photosynthesis, you got your, your leaves, which are essentially big solar panels, collecting the sun's energy, taking that energy and converting it with, uh, with water into glucose and sugars, okay? Then you kind of go on to a next step of synthesis, which is a little bit more complicated. Now we're taking air, nitrogen, carbon, carbon dioxide from the air and also from the soil and converting that into amino acids, proteins, nutrients, so on and so forth. Here's another interesting step. This is the next step that I kind of get excited about. So now we go down into the rhizosphere, the first six, eight inches or so of the soil. And we start finding root exudates and exudation. It's where these plants are taking some of these sugars and they're actually pumping them, they're releasing them and they're pumping them down through their roots. And it, it may seem like a waste at first when you hear that, but what's happening is that they are contributing to and feeding the microbiology that exists within that soil level. And as that microbiology, those microbes, as they're commonly referred to, come to feed on, on those sugars that are made available to them, they in and of themselves through that process are releasing elements and nutrients to the plant, which the plant can then take up. So now we're getting to a real symbiotic living web relationship, which, uh, which we talk about a lot, we, fo we focus on it a lot, you hear a lot about it, kind of out in, the, in this realm. But that's an important component because now we're dealing with a healthy soil food web. And that is really the key to, I believe that is the key to fertility and activating those nutrients, making them available to your plant through a biological activity of letting, of that relationship of the micro, microbiology microorganisms, macroorganisms as well, and the transference and the transfer with the plants as well. Then we get into aggregation. John spoke to this too. So now we've got similar soil particles that are starting to bind together. And uh, you know, when I was first learning about it, they s talked about cottage cheese. Now I think the thing is chocolate cake, like that big, tall, luscious <laughs> chocolate cake, and you cut that big piece out and you look at it and it's small and it's crumbly and it's aerated and it's aerobic and it's moist. We want to see that in our soils. Now we're letting air and water infiltrate through there. That also makes it easier for fungi and other organisms to move through there and to transfer those nutrients and makes that process easier and makes it happen. Then we get into humification, humus, which is something we hear about. Done a lot of research on it. It's pretty hard to define. You know, it's a real stable organic carbon, I guess, is how you could define humus. But we know it's full of nutrients. We know that it allows ion exchange within the soil, which helps to make more nutrients and, min and minerals available to the plants. And there's just a lot of good that comes out of that stability. And it's interesting to me too, I've used the word stability a couple times because we've gone from a, I'm not gonna say complex, but one thing I really enjoy about healthy, biologically active, healthy soils is their stability. You know, and these nutrients, talking about bringing things in off the farm, it's real stable. I'm not worried about this stuff washing away. I'm not worried about it getting hot and sun shining on it and it goes up in the atmosphere. I, you know, those things aren't occurring to that degree when we have healthy, active soils. Okay, so why am I telling you all this? Because I am not a soil scientist, I'll tell you right now. 
But you know, that brings up a point too. Let me just say this. I think that you could spend the rest of your life studying any one of those process, and it wouldn't be a life wasted. It's so complex. There's so much we kind of still don't know about soil and what's going on and what's happening with it. And that, you know, that'd be great. It's great to know more about our soils, and it's great to, to take it to that level. At the same time, I don't have to do that. I don't have to understand these complicated intricacies and exactly what's going on down there. That isn't necessary for me, for you, for us, for all of us to move forward with a lot of these processes. So here's an example of some high density grazing. This is what we shoot for and practice as best we can here on the farm. As you'll see here, you know, I've taken it down pretty well. This is our pasture. Basically, I take our animals, our uh, sheep and cattle, our animals that are eating grass mainly, and I'm putting them in a tight space, and I'm moving them frequently. This gets into non-selective grazing. You know, they're moving into a tight spot. They're going in every 24, 12, sometimes every eight hours, and they're kind of thinking, you know, if I don't go ahead and eat, then my buddy's going to do it. So they come in here, they start this real active feed intake. You know, we got good eaters, good appetites, and they don't have the time or the space to selectively graze and to go out and pick what they want first and then second and then third and kind of leave what they don't want and then, oh, I don't want that at all. And I'm not saying that we have to make our animals eat forbs and grasses that they don't want to eat. But I am suggesting that in this tighter space, it does encourage them to consume as much as they can. Plus we're getting a large amount of animal impact on that piece of ground. It also, it adds this element of, I was thinking about the right word here and I haven't come up with it, discipline, if you will, to our, to our animals. And from there, we're able to select who's performing good under this system, who isn't. And I don't want to get off topic too far and talk about breeding and getting into that and body condition scores. But I'll say this. There are a lot of animals in the world that are spending their cool nights in a warm barn and spending their hot days in a nice, cool, shaded spot and getting all the warmer they want and that nice, beautiful little smells good to me when I open the bag of alfalfa pellets and yada, yada, yada. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying there is anything wrong with that. But to get our animals to perform to their maximum capability, it's important for us to have them in this system that demands that of them as well. I found that there's a lot less maintenance and a lot less that I have to do for them when they're in kind of a tighter run system. If we just kind of let them have at it, you know, what's gonna happen is they're gonna go get what they want first and maybe they eat that for a week and then they go get what they want second and then maybe they eat that yada, 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 and they be able to, and then this selective grazing, they're able to choose from this diversity that they have out there. When we kind of put a more non-selective grazing uh, application to them, what they're getting tomorrow is going to be real similar to what they got today, which was real similar to what they ate yesterday. And I don't argue that the grass in itself and the nutrients within the grass and digestible nitrogen, blah, 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 you know, that's going to be different in January as it is in June. But to have more of a consistent intake level for them, uh, I found has been very helpful as well. So that's a little bit about the animals. Now, let's work backwards for a second about that whole fertility thing and go to humates and aggregation. Well, if photosynthesis was the beginning of that, then I want as much photosynthesis as I can have happening on our farms and in our pastures. So now taking that grass down and getting them to graze a fair amount of it and trample a fair amount of it, when I take them off that, I just made that solar panel so much bigger. 
and I'm allowing the growing tips and the plants and all those leaves to receive as much sunlight as they can and go through that natural process of building fertility. And in that kind of mindset, we're using the animals as a tool for that. And it's all working in, in good symbiosis as well. You know, this is really close to mimicking nature. When you find the great herds in the world, you're gonna find a lot of similarities here to that they are packed together tight for this is maybe an old lesson, you hear this a lot, but they're packed together tight because of predators. They're moving, again, because of predators, but also to get fresh grass. And they're leaving behind a really dense, trampled area, a lot of aeration with the hooves, a lot of uh, manure, a lot of animal impact, a lot of animals themselves, great numbers, and also great, diverse, great amounts of diversity have have impacted that area. And it's followed by the birds and gazelles and antelope and wildebeest and yada, 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 pick a continent and start naming animals. And then an appropriate recovery period to let that area kind of digest that, deal with that, let everything do its thing and recover. And that's getting more into kind of the management aspect of what, what we're doing here. And we'll see a little bit of that when we go outside. But my point is that I want a lot of photosynthesis happening, and this is one of the best ways I can think of to get it. And it's working out. It really increases the productivity of our fields and of our animals, because we're growing more grass and our animals are eating more of it. So that's allowed us to, to up our stocking rates, as well as the increased fertility, because now also we're growing more grass as well. And, and again, I'm talking about growing grass. You know, you get to a point where the animals, don't get me wrong, I mean, we love our animals and we're as good to them as we can be, but they're less like these cute little adorable things and they're more like a tool that we're using to, to build our fertility and to harvest our grass and, you know, profiting from it. And that's what they're talking about when you hear, I'm converting solar energy into protein that's available for humans. If you guys have any questions throughout this, just stop me. Do you have any questions? So you're raising sheep and cows. Sheep and cows and pigs and chickens. This is a trial that we're doing. It's actually right out there. And like I said, we're going to walk right beside it. So we'll go check it out. But we're doing some trials here with actually some, some biochar and some vinegar. But so, you know, here's one little trial. And over there's another one. And over there's another one. And it's kind of hard to see just from a photo. But that on our pastures is more or less what it's going to look like when we leave it. Today's the 22nd, so that's what, um, you know, 40, 45 days recovery period when we go to look at it. So you'll get an idea of what that recovery period looks like here on the farm. Talking about zones, and uh, we'll get into that later too, but our fertility on the farm fluctuates. Our species that's in the field and pastures fluctuates, but it has all responded well to this management program that we've implemented. Uh, it's taken some time, but we're seeing good results. So just kind of stare at that for a second. So that's what this thing was 45 days ago or so. Our animal diversity has been very fun it's been challenging at times. It's been beneficial as well. So as you can see, we've got sheep. And here's a couple donkeys. We had a donkey that came with the farm, and then we got another one. They're kind of our pets, but they're also serving as livestock protection. I've never lost any lambs to coyotes or predators at all. All of the neighbors are amazed, but we never have. Here's some cattle that we have, some steers. So. The cattle and the sheep are in together, and they move and live together. So this is where we're going. This is where we are. This is where we've been. Let's see what happens when I do this. So right here, right along this line, is our back fence to keep our cattle, our flurd, from going back. And you know, obviously, we have this one here to keep them from coming up. 
But in the back, we've got pigs, chickens, a goose, a couple geese. Those are some more animals that we have. They're following the flirt because they don't actually eat grass in the same way that, you know, these ruminant animals do. However, grass and pasture and being outside, it is an important component to their nutrition. Chickens and pigs do eat grass, they just can't live off of it. So this diversity is adding so much benefit to our, our whole farm and getting back again to the, some of these permaculture ideas is treating this thing as one living organism and one ecosystem. You know, all these animals are getting different things, they're eating different things, they're depositing different things, and all that has a relationship about, with what's going on above and below the soil level as well. My first mentor told me something that, that I want to repeat. When you invite a new species to your farm, you inadvertently invite eight others that come along with that species. And this is plants and animals and the whole kit and caboodle. So, you know, we're talking about diversity and I'm just gonna give you my personal, my opinion on it. And unless, you know, we can get scientific and break down how everything goes, but you guys have, this isn't the first time you've heard about diversity, is it? The healthiest ecosystems that I've ever come across are fierce and wild, and they're very diverse, and everything is fighting hard to get what nutrients and resources are available to it. And we've also, we see that diversity as an indicator as well as a tool. We have seen more of the native grasses come back. We have seen more of our weed population and our invasive weeds. Uh, they're starting to decline in number. They're going away. That's cool, that's great, that's awesome. And that diversity really helps with that. And again, as we see more diversity happening on the farm, I think that we are achieving, we're getting closer to our goal of a healthier ecosystem. Well, here's a movie. Let's see what happens. There's actually some bare spots Kind of right there. I threw this in here just in case they don't cooperate for you guys later on. <laughs> we use uh, netting. Um, our sister farm in Florida, which has a pretty high number, they have a lot of cattle. Their whole perimeter fence is one strand of wire, and they move all those cattle with one reel. And that's like a dream for me, because <laughs> I'm out here with this fence. But, you know, as you saw in here, this picture. So, you know, I was all the way back there. I just want to talk about logistics just for a second. So I was all the way back there on this distant fence line, and then we run this straight, and we're essentially strip grazing. And it allows us with all these different species, that does make it a lot, a lot easier. And it enables us to be able to do that uh, to a pretty large degree. And that's the, another reason I threw in that little clip. Yes. How big are the sections that you've got to stop and then how long do you use them on the section? Great question. We move them anywhere from 24 to 12 hours, generally. Okay, so very intensive. So it's, it's pretty intense. Um, I, <laughs> I was joking with somebody the other day about how every, how it depends is the appropriate answer for like every question. It seems like in farming it's so appropriate. Mainly it's gonna depend on the season for us uh, and, and for how often that we're moving them and, and that space and how much forage we have as well and what condition the forage is in. We, run on a, it fluctuates, on a 45 to 60 day recovery period, basically, when we bring them back around. So depending on how much forage has regrown in that, that'll determine how long those animals stay there. You know, winter stockpile, we, uh, I actually keep them much smaller and move them much more off often because it isn't actively growing, it is 
you know, kind of dormant. I say kind of because, you know, your grasses and stuff will, will grow here during the winter, just not as much as in the warm season. It's all a dance with space, time, and numbers, really. In this picture, you have, you said you did a long straight run. Is that like electromagnetic up the sides and you have a piece in the middle that you're moving down through the strip? Exactly. So up the side and then I'm moving this laterally. Is that the word I want? And then over here is our perimeter fence. So I'm able to hook the end of this, the right hand side of this, into our perimeter fence. That's a over here, which is a solid fence. And today we'll go look at a spot where it gets a little tricky because one of my sides isn't perimeter. So I had to run two big long runs of electro netting. And then basically I just, I spend a lot of time leapfrogging myself and, and moving the animals along. You know, it's a little bit of a pain when you're running those big long runs in your break, you know, but the chores of just moving the animals, especially if you can set yourself up and set your fence up, especially if you have some extra fencing and you can set yourself up a couple days ahead, you know, it's gonna take us a lot longer to walk out there than it is to go do the work. And that's important. I think it's important for me to add that, maybe not for you all specifically, but a lot of people get scared of that fencing. And it's, you know, it's not that bad. For this stuff, I'll put it, right, I won't worry about it. I'll just put it on up. Yeah, I have another little film to show you about that later on. Uh, so I don't want to spoil the surprise. <laughs> okay, we watched that. What else do we have? Here's some logistics of um, our pigs in with the chickens. We had our, uh, I had the hogs in with the flurred for a while, and it really didn't work out very well for a couple reasons, but really the main one is that the sheep and the cows are trying to get to pig feed the whole time, and it was just so much trouble, more than it was worth to try and keep them out of it, but allow the pigs to still be able to access it. I find chickens and pigs get along very well. This is an old trailer. It definitely isn't much to look at, but boy, it sure did make a nice chicken house. You know, I don't want to get into building stuff too much. You all probably have your own experiences. Man, if it works and if it's laying around or if I saw it's been laying in the neighbor's yard for two years, hey man, I put that to use. And now it's our roof or now it's our door or now it's our whatever it may be. We just ran some rat wire on the inside of that. It was a staple, you know, a staple gun to keep the predators out of the chickens. Uh, chickens go in there every night, they open the door every morning. I've known some farmers now who are getting into like automation. So they get on their cell phones and the door opens and then they get on it and then their door closes. That, that's cool. We're not there yet. The chicken feed is up here. The pig food is, uh, it's actually around the corner. My apologies for the slide. It's just a basic tub feeder with a trough. I cut a piece of plywood, I put some hinges on it, the pigs pick it up, the chickens can't pick it up. Simple as that. When I wanna move them, I close the pig feeder off, I get a little bit of feed, I throw it in here, I close this gate, I do this in the morning while the chickens are still in there, I hook the front of this trailer to the tractor, I hook the back of the pig house to the, uh, excuse me, the front of the pig house to the back of the chicken tractor, Go put them anywhere you want them. Pick your netting up, put your netting down. It's pretty, it's pretty easy. These are layers. We, we've taken a step back from our broiler production, but um, we hope to amp it up next year. And, you know, talking about animal impact, let me go there with you for a second. You know, when we did have broilers, they were separate. They were in separate housing and separate units. We did the, uh, the dragging pens, we, we, we did all that. And I don't know what turned a screw in my head, but I said, why? And the last couple runs of broilers we've had, they just go right in with the layers, you know, and I've not seen any issues with that. I guess you could get technical with that and say, well, there's different nu nutrient requirements. You want your broilers to have a higher percentage feed and blah, blah, blah than your layers. And then maybe your layers are eating too much because you don't want your broilers, you don't want their feed to go empty, you just want them to gain. And you know, I'll leave that up for you to determine. For us, 
as far as maximizing our animal impact and the ease of our, of our lives, that worked out really well for us. We used to breed and raise turkeys as well. I hope to get turkeys back into the mix as well. I don't know that turkeys and chickens get along too well. They didn't when I tried, but we'll see. We'll cross our fingers and see. That's a cool picture. I just wanted to throw that in there. Uh, I wish I could get a little closer up. There's eight pigs right there. And this was December 7th or 8th of last year. We had some snow and everybody gets along really well. So introducing cover crops into this system. We are recently working with putting cover crops in our pastures. That's something that we haven't had much need or desire to do before. Uh, the need hasn't increased, but the desire has in an effort to graze the cover crops. I was alone this day. Obviously, I could only do that. Maybe I should have done a selfie, but uh, that stuff's about 10 feet tall. This is a multi-species cover crop, summer mix that we've planted. There are eight, eight or 10 different species in this mix. This picture was taken in July. That cover crop was planted in May growing an incredible amount of biomass in our, uh, in our cover cropping systems, uh, at least for this, for this run. You know, the ability for cover crops to recycle the nutrients and mine the nutrients and recycle them and keep them there and stimulate all that biology is really tremendous and it's very, very wonderful. I want to say that cover crops bring about some timing issues. And again, I like to work backwards. So when I think about planting a cover crop, I'm thinking, well, first of all, what is my why, what's the purpose of this? What do I want to gain out of them? Do I want to suppress weeds for vegetables? Do I want to add nitrogen to the soil for a following crop? Do I want to do all of this? Do I want to feed the livestock? What all am I, do I want to suppress weeds in a pasture? These are all things to take into account and your different cover crops will help aid you in those different, do you know, do we want to feed the pollinators and focus on that? Different cover crop species will help you determine that question for yourselves. But, you know, what we're going to see here well, this, for example, was a um, just trying to gain biomass and get as much carbon sequestered into the soil as we could and leave as much of that biomass behind as we could in an effort to really build fertility and also feeding that biological level with the diversity of the mix as well. This is the field that we're going to see. It does not look like this. I wish it did, but it doesn't. I kind of want to show you all, I'm not going to say the worst, but I don't want to take you all out here today and show you what's beautiful. I'd rather take you and show you what we're working with and what we've been trying to develop over the years. The biggest thing I'd say, you know, a termination of cover crop, you're, you're basically going to, not entirely, but basically you're going to crimp it you're going to mow it or you're going to graze it. And what determines what we do to eliminate our cover crop depends entirely on what's coming next. At one of our other locations, we hope to grow these cover crops and, and crimp them. I'll show you the crimper in a second, which is to say lay them down with the entirety of their, of their biomass for weed suppression and also nutrient recycling and then follow that with, with vegetable production and plant right into that. You know, what we've done this season is add some diversity into our mix and add some diversity into our, our pastures to feed those beneficials and also give our, give our animals a little, bit more to, uh, a little bit more to eat as well. One thing about grazing these cover crops is, again, the timing of it. If you can hit it when they've reached, you know, their the full potential of their growth, they really lay down easy. And what we've found is, you know, pretty tight groups 
is going to optimize the animal's ability to take as much of the feed in as they can. If we leave it huge and let them walk all over the place, they'll trample it and soil it a lot quicker than they would if we tighten it up. Tightening it up, we're, we're utilizing more of, of what's there, utilizing more of what we have available to them. You definitely, you know, I don't see this kind of impact on perennial grasses. I mean, that's pretty heavy impact. So it's important for us too, as far as the strategy, to come back very quickly, especially in spring. If we want to maintain a cover cropped area and keep it into cover crops, it's important that we come back here and drill that and plant that into the next succession of cover crops as quickly as we can. Elsewise, the weeds will grow and they'll benefit from all that impact and then you've got to deal with those weeds all over again. Here's the crimper. This is mainly vetch. This is a winter cover crop, and this is in May when it's reached its, uh, it's, it's grown quite a bit. It's not flowering as much as I'd like, but so be it. See that path? So when your cover crop's this tall, or 10 tall, or this tall, that's how we set up our fences. That little rig's right outside. We'll go look at it on the way out. That's always a lot of fun. There's always a little guesswork. The neighbors think I'm crazy. They think I'm out there like driving all around with this big loud metal thing on the back of the four-wheeler, which I am, but there's a method to the madness. But that also gives you an idea of that crimping action. I mean, all we're doing is taking that cover crop, laying it down, kind of squashing it throughout its, its its body, the body of the plant. In the same way that you take a hose and you do this, you mash it up and the water start, stops coming out. So it is an effective way to terminate cover crop. In their mature stage. In their mature stage, yeah. great, great point. If you do that to a cover crop in its juvenile stage, it won't terminate it at all. If it has lived its life out, starting to seed, putting in its energy into making seeds, reached the height and bulk density that it's gonna reach, it can't bounce back from that. Yes. Would, you, would you ever let it go to seed to reseed itself or just? Sure, yeah, yeah sure. Mm -hmm. You know, if cover crops become our weeds, that's not a bad thing. I might. You know, if, you, if you're in vegetable production and we're talking about certain things, I might be a little weary of it, like buckwheat. You know, buckwheat can really can take over. And it's not some horrible, obnoxious weed, but it's just another thing you got to deal with. Uh, but yeah, there's not a thing in the world wrong with that. You'll have to come back and reseed it. I don't think it's going to turn over that well. But there's certainly not a thing in the world wrong with letting the seed bake regenerate like that. Again, it's a, it's a timing thing. Say we did that with a cool season cover crop, you know, so we've got long leaf grasses and grain, we've got oats and barley and rye, and we've got peas and vetch and phacelia, or whatever you may have. And, you know, first of all, these things are gonna seed and develop at different times. And it won't be an incredibly long amount of time, but, you know, a couple months, I'm gonna say May, June, maybe even getting into July, it's gonna take them to seed. If you're trying to come back in there with another cover crop, like a warm season cover crop, you might be pushing it a little bit because then you're getting a little late with planting that. So again, it's just a matter of kind of working backwards. But you know, we've seen that here on the farm. You know, we've seen vetch come back. We've seen peas come back. It's cool. It's cool to be walking through the middle of the pasture and it's like, wow, there's a big, there's some millet that I never planted or there's some or that I had planted a long ago, or I planted over there, and now it's found its way over here, stuff like that. Getting that in your seed bank can be, can be great. That's what they look like moving down the line. What we'll see today, I actually, I didn't really do it here, probably because it's too warm, but I'll leave my back fence. So if I have my animals here, and then I move them here, here's their water. Say I put the animals water here, and say I put my animals here. And then I move them here on my next break, and here on my next break, and here on my next break. When I move this water, and when I bring this up, in the growing season, it's about every four days. 
three to four days. In the winter, I'm a little bit more relaxed about it, and it may be six or seven days before I, I call it my back fence, before I bring that back fence up. When you bring that back fence up, you make their area that much smaller again. But what's interesting is they don't spend a lot of time at all where they have already been, because they've already, they've had at it. When I'm doing the cover crops, I totally, I leapfrog them. I keep them as tight as I can when I'm trying to, again, utilize all that, for the most part. I, I don't want to say always, or I always do this. We'll get into that later, but that is a good strategy for managing our cover crops and, and keeping them tight and having that high level of animal density and high, high, high density grazing. Does that make sense? So this is what it used to look like. This is a little bit, we are right here. And I got this picture from the county when we, the farm first purchased this land. And what's interesting about it, there's a lot of things, and it's gonna make the most sense to me, obviously, because I'm the one who stares at it every day, or is on the farm every day. However, over here, and getting into here, we still see a lot of, of issues on this land. And as you can see, it's, it's like this, similar to this across the street. This has been worked. This has been tilled. This was in uh, row crop production. I think it was beans and corn. And we're still seeing some of the effects of that today. You know, not tilling our soils, and I want to try and tie this into some of what John was saying. That ability for soils to aggregate and, and be aerobic and have that life in them, especially that fungus, that fungi that spread and get really expansive and go all over the place, a lot of that comes from, from not disturbing the soil. And uh, I want to get into some bigger picture stuff here too, because I'm going to kind of wrap it up. My wife was, a, was an assist, assistant high school basketball coach. She was an assistant coach for a high school girls team. And uh, so I watched a lot of basketball when she was doing that. And she was um, really successful, and the head coach was really successful. They won state like two or three times, and I think they won state three times in two years. Anyway, and he's won many more championships since then to prove that his coaching abilities were really remarkable. So I watched a lot of basketball, and the reason I'm telling you all this is they get done on defense, they'd get the ball back, or the other team would score, or whatever, and they'd be coming back on offense. And before they got onto their half of the court, not every game, but almost every game, he'd holler it out, he'd go, let it work, let it work. And then they'd get into their half of the court, and then he'd just stand there, you know? And I remember watching that thinking, man, that's what I gotta do. That is totally applicable, applicable to me and to what I'm doing. It can take a second for these systems to work and to come into place and to reach their own. They are living, they're ever evolving. Let it work, you know? It's not an incredibly rigid thing. A lot of the times when I mess up here on the farm, it's because I'm rigid. You will eat this because I put you in here and you will grow, mm -mm. you know, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. I'll never know what these animals want more than the animals themselves. So it becomes my job as a producer or a farmer or a steward, whatever you want to say, to be incredibly observant and try and get as close as I, and try and get there as best as I can through observation and through that connection. And, you know, be good to yourselves while you're figuring this stuff out. It's, it, can be, it can be tricky, but it's fun and it's exhilarating too. You know, not tilling the soil, having a living root in there for as long as possible so it can have your photosynthesis, feeding the microbes, having diversity, having animal impact. You know, those are five huge things that I think can help any farm. And we've kind of gotten into the into the why of all of that. It gets fun when you get into the how, I think. It gets fun, it gets challenging. And again, like I was saying about messing up, 
you know, I wanted things to be tip top and perfect for you guys. I went to move the animals yesterday and they were out. Just so you know, when we go look at it, the animals got out yesterday. Looked like they pulled the fence up, tied it in a knot and threw it in the corner. Have you ever gone to your farm and you're like, how did you do that? Like, I can't even, how'd you do that? I mean, it, it happens, you know? And the only way that I'm gonna put my chin on my chest and my tail between my legs is if I'm like, oh, I failed, huh? Failure isn't failure if you learn a lesson. So be confident and brave enough to fail. This is what it looks like now. Here's where we are, here's our upper pond that John was talking about. This is the swale here in the water capture that we have going down into the lower pond which is down here and the windmills here. This layout, this map really helps us manage our farm. All these little zones like this is down the hill and this is a draw and this is over by the barn so we get some nutrient runoff and the pigs are over here so this little spot's kind of rich. And up here is what I showed you across the street, yada, 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 yada. All these little things have different stuff happening in them. But we're able to manage that and say, well, how long were they in 19? How long were they in 7? How much grass in winter? How much grass do I have in, you know, number 18, number 10? What do I foresee? How long do I foresee them being in there? So on and so forth. And we can regulate that throughout the year and with our stockpiling and winter feeding practices as well. And we get closer and closer every year to, to feeding less and less hay. I don't want to talk too much about stockpiling. I'd love to find that sweet spot like on the bat when you hit a home run and you never feel it, it didn't hurt your hands. I'd love to have maximum production on the farm and never feed hay. Hopefully I'll get there one day. I've, I'm really shooting for 300 days of grazing, which we've achieved before and I think we'll achieve it this year as, as well. A lot of that's going to depend on your stocking rate and then your stock density of what you're eating, yada, yada. I don't want to get too far going down that. So that's my son. I could roll him around in water and then go wring out a shirt. That's one way I could capture water. We're talking about future here and permaculture, and I just wanted to try and bring this stuff full circle. You know, for the past couple weeks, I've been a little nervous about this class, that John would come up and give his spiel and I would come up and give my spiel and someone would go integrating permaculture and livestock, okay. So how do you integrate them? And you know, I don't think that there's a very direct answer for that. It's not like the buckle and then the seat belt and you stick it in there and voila. It's not that straightforward. These are, these are living systems. They function off of each other. They're tools, they're not etched in stone. They're things that you can use and apply to your farm. If you understand the whys and if you understand or feel confident enough, then you can go and implement the, the hows. And it's, it's great, it's fun as can be. Every farm's different too. I mean, there's, a, there's all these different interpretations of all this stuff which I think is pretty exciting too. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up. That's my girl, that's my boy, that's some dent corn we grew. Are there any questions? Does everyone wanna go for a walk? Yeah, yeah. There you have it. Mm -hmm.